Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I am joined by my two co-hosts, Michael Hall and Michael Reed. The Burgundy Zone is a part of the Frederick Podcast Network. You can find out more by going to www.listenfrederick.com. But we are rejoined with Logan Paulson of the Command Center and the Take Command Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us on this Monday, Logan. It's it's a beautiful day, isn't it? It is. It was, it was really nice to camp this morning. Started getting hot this afternoon, but yeah, really nice day. It was, and I was gonna, my first question for you. Can you give us a recap of today's practice? It was uh, there has been rumblings that it was like kind of like pick city, you strap city, you could say, where the defense got a lot of picks on the quarterbacks, and it looked like fans were kind of flipping out about Carson Wentz. So, what did you see from practice? What, what a recap in general. Yeah, I mean, so this, uh, so this is kind of like the the fifth day of like uh, kind of a bad stretch for the offense. I think. Um, defense deserves a lot of credit. They're getting a lot of pressure. They're, they're doing a good job in the back end of kind of blanketing coverage, but yeah, I think, um, Carson has struggled a little bit over the first five days. And when you compare that or juxtapose that to his OTA period, you kind of say, well, what happened to that guy in OTA? So I think they're working through some stuff right now. I think the pressure early from the defense, uh, the blitz packages, the, the nice rushes, the kind of mismatch along the offensive line. There's been some injuries. There's been some guys not participating. Um, has really affected, honestly, Carson Wentz's performance. And, you know, everyone says, oh, he's not getting hit. But it's really hard to make accurate reads and be good with your footwork when there's a lot of quick, fast pressure. And so I think what you see with him is that when his footwork gets inconsistent, uh, he relies too much on his arm talent. Um, he's inaccurate. And that, that kind of showed up today. He had a couple bad misses. Um, he also had a nice, uh, you know, red zone period, made some really nice completions, uh, tight window throws that you kind of say, wow. But um, I'd say on the whole, over the first five days, it's been a little on the disappointing side from him. I wanted to ask you a question before you go, Reed, um, because back with Indianapolis and even going back to Philly, you could say Carson is used to the bigger bodied wide receiver and even tight ends he utilized a lot. Do you think that has a lot a lot to do with his kind of acclimation process to the younger, the smaller type of shiftier wide receivers that he's dealing with day in and day out? Because I don't see the miscues, the inaccuracy issues with tight ends as much. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably a fair assessment. I mean, you're going to have a hard press. You're going to be hard pressed finding a bigger group of tight ends in the NFL right. than the Washington football team has or the commanders <laughs> have right now. You know, they're all sure. huge, huge men. So, um, you know, I don't know. I don't think so. I think a lot of his inaccuracies, a lot of his issues today, uh, I think like he had a he had a bad miss to the tight end today where he overthrew Cole Turner and, you know, Cole Turner's, Turner 6'7". Right. And he's got a 32-inch vertical, so it's kind of hard to get that ball up and over his head, but he managed to find a way to get that done. Um, and also, he just seems a little bit unsettled. That's all I'm going to say. He just seems a little unsettled. Okay. He had one today. Uh, you know, I talked about this on my podcast where they're running like a crossing concept, like a post by the outside guy and then a crosser that's kind of clearing this void over here that's by the post. And instead of kind of keeping his eyes disciplined down the field, he just stared down the crosser the whole way. And, you know, that's just bad. That's just not good quarterback play at that point. You know what I mean? And I think um, obviously something's got him a little unsettled. I would say it's probably the pressure, maybe the stress of the upcoming season, a lot riding on his shoulders for sure. Uh, but, you know, I think, um, I think there's a lot of room still yet for this offense to grow. There's a lot of days to training camp left. There's a lot of days for kind of Scott to find what, Carson likes and to develop a plan to support him. So as much as fans want to kind of freak out right now and, you know, myself, like to be totally honest, I'm a little, you know, in terms of things to be worried about Carson Wentz is slowly working its way up my list, but I'm, I'm going to trust in Ron. I'm going to trust in this staff and I'm going to trust in the excellent skill position players that he's got. Mm. And to answer your question, I don't think the size is that big of an issue. It's a I think question. those, I no, I think those, no, yeah, no, 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 it's, 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 it's it not was. a dumb question. <laughs> I think <was>. those dudes, <laughs> <laughs> I think those dudes play bigger than they are, you know, and like big dudes, like bigger catch radiuses, but I think they've got Terry Jahan outstanding catch radiuses. Cam Sims is not uh, a small dude by any stretch of the imagination. So um, he's just kind of working out some chemistry stuff with them at this point, I think. And hopefully the more time on task they get, the better they start to look. Yeah. And Carson, this seems to kind of be a trend in Carson's career where it's like, he eats so inconsistent. It seems like one day he's really good at my best friend, Pat, Mac not my best friend, sorry, Logan. But Pat McAfee <laughs> says that, that that's his that's his thing about about Carson. He's like Commanders fans. One day he's going to be amazing. The next day he's going to be terrible. And uh, 
shout out to Pat, but I, I hate his little minions that always talk bad about us. Uh, it's, it's not oh. fun. It's not who's cool. Talking, who's talking bad about you, bro? Well, not me. No, God, nobody talks bad about me. You know that. Um, yeah. But <laughs> yeah, so not me, but like the commanders in general. But, uh, oh, I anyway. guess you. Yeah. No, but so for those of people who don't know out there, Kyle, um, this might be a bit of an easy question, but uh, you are the perfect person to explain it. At this stage in camp, which side of the ball tends to be further ahead? I mean, usually it's the defense and they're usually pretty, pretty significantly ahead, you know, and it kind of, it'll be defense for a while and the offense will bounce back. So I think, I think that's the other thing. Part of me was hoping that one of these days, Saturday or Monday today would be a bounce back day for the the offense. Obviously that wasn't the case. Um, But, you know, there's still, again, there's still a lot of time left for that to happen in the offense to kind of find its feet and get more of the offense in and start making more plays. So I think that's something, um, You know, for the defense to be ahead of the offense at, that point, at this point, that's totally to be expected. And that's, you know, I can't think of a time in my entire career where the offense was ahead of the defense at this point. So um, very, very normal. Um, I think the thing that kind of upset expectations was how sharp the OTA period was. Right. You know, it was just very, very solid for them. And, I, you know, I think that's part of the reason why, I, you know, my expectations were higher for the offense coming in. I learned that very early on in life. When you first start doing something, just suck at it. Don't go out there and show off <laughs> because you, then you set the expectations too high. If you go on a date, be an, be an asshole. Be, yeah. terrible, be sloppy. It, when your first day at work, mess everything up, break the copying machine. Who cares? You know, yeah. it's only up from there. So that's what Carson should do. I think, but he hasn't been the same since that fan asked him for his wedding band. Why? <laughs> Is that what happened? That's probably what's bugging him. That might be it. He's probably like, why did I come There's something on his mind, right? It's probably that band. Like, is he over there? He's going to ask you for my band again? No, because the fans like stalking him to his car, following him, walking on all fours, going like (laughs) one ring to rule. He just get out of here with that. (laughs) He started from us. And you're like, what? That was pretty good, dude. Jeez. That's all I got. Oh, sorry. Oh, man. Life lessons from Reed. Um, I was listening to William Jackson. Jackson's press conference yesterday and he was uh the press was asking him questions after practice and whatnot and he pretty much just seemed like a really confident guy seems a lot more comfortable this year do you think he's gonna poise for a big year this year seeing how I know Fred Smoot said that it usually takes a, a cornerback like at least two years to kind of adjust to a new system come in so because uh, definitely because he was a man guy they're using him more in zone here so do you think he's poised for a big year this year now that he's a little bit more comfortable in the system well, you know, I think that's a good question. I say the first five days of training camp, he's looked very, very, very good. Very good. A lot of varies. Looked very sharp, very confident. Alignments, assignments, depths of like drops, understanding how the offense is trying to attack him, passing off concepts, matching concepts. Done a very, very nice job. I don't think he's given up a completion to his area of coverage, maybe one in five days. So obviously performing at a very high level, which is encouraging. Um, you know, but he didn't look very good in OTAs and minicamp. And, um, and so like, there is a level of flux to his performance to this point. I tend to think that he's trending in the right direction, that whole secondary. Oh my gosh, man, they've been playing very, very well. And it's very exciting to watch them. So hopefully they can continue that. Hopefully William Jackson, the third can continue that. Cause I think if they can kind of figure this out, especially against the run of quarterbacks, this team has for this season, it's going to be a, uh, a pretty special year. It could be potentially. Yeah, one of the bigger news from training camp today was the fact that Curtis Samuel is not out there. And Coach Rivera had alluded to the kind of plan that the doctors have in place. And what I imaged in my mind was like his usage in camp being like a a cell phone bar symbol, you know, going up, down, up, down throughout the time. What is, are you, should we be preaching panic or patience with Curtis Samuel? Like, are you buying what Coach Rivera is selling here? Um, so anything about Curtis's injury, I have to say that I don't really know anything about the injury other than the location of the injury, which is approximately the adductor and adductors traditionally are a very kind of finicky, like finicky injury, right? They do a lot in terms of how your body functions at the hip, okay. right? They kind of, they abduct your hip, they bring your leg in, they extend your hip, they bring your leg back, which are both really key features for running. So in football, there's a lot of ways to aggravate that injury very consistently. So they do tend to linger. I've never personally heard of one lasting for a year, you know, so obviously he's coming off a surgery. There's multi it's multifactorial in terms of what is going on with him. But um, I'm I'm I guess I'm I'm a little surprised. I'll say that. But again, I'm not a doctor. I haven't had been been privy to any information (laughs) that would give me anything different than that. But um, yeah, it's I guess surprise is the word, but I'm going to trust that they have the system in place. It feels like if I got my conspiracy cap on a little bit like 
things are worse than they actually are. Okay. But I'm going to trust, I'm going to be an optimist and say Ron's, you know, handling this right way. The doctors are handling this the right way. Curtis will be ready for the season and he'll be a dynamic weapon within the, this offense. So that's what I'm leaning towards. Yeah, you're Professor Paulson now. So we're now we, yeah. your next step is Dr. Paulson. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No conspiracies when you're a doctor. Yeah, my I doctor can't do tells that. me, my doctor always asks me like who shot JFK and like what happened to Tower 7? I'm like, dude, just stop. It is weird. It is weird when your doctor asks you that. Like they're getting ready to give you a shot or something. They're like, or like the moon, do you think the moon's you... real? Bang. And you're yeah, like, and you're like, no. you're like, I didn't know if space and the birds were fake as his fingers are inside of you and he's checking for some sort of cancer or something. Yeah, but, like, cool. Yeah, like, do you even believe in cancer? What is <laughs> <laughs> but uh your boy cole turner has kind of been lighting it up a lot of people yeah. <laughs> really kyle's having fun a lot of we have we like that fun on the burgundy zone a lot of people are talking about cole turner what do you see from him do you think that he can really have a realistic pretty big impact in year one um all i can speak to is what he's done and be it and that he's been a beast the past two days like he's he hasn't had a lot of targets but like when he runs certain routes even routes to draw coverage you see a skill set that i think supports a guy who deserves uh, maybe a broader usage within the context of the offense. So like he's, he's not twitched up on every single route, but like seams corners, um, even some in cuts off a speed cut. He's very dynamic, you know, in terms of being a man of his stature and being able to get in and out of cuts. Um, And so I do think he's a guy that might kind of lend itself to kind of um, finding ways to get him isolated by formation to get them in one-on-one situations to, to win those one-on-one matchups versus linebackers and safeties. And I think he's kind of laying the foundation for that argument, especially over the last two days. He ran like a, what we call a jerk route, which is where you run at the mic linebacker, settle down and then run vertical towards the goalpost. And you're in a one-on-one situation with the backer. And it's usually like, you know, let me get, throw me an alley-oop and I'll right. dunk it over the crossbar type thing. Mm-hmm. And he excels at that. He ran an excellent route today, a seam route on uh, the four, on uh, forest in the end zone and just the twitch and the suddenness and the double stick at the top again speaks to a very unique skill set so i think there's a guy that there's a lot of there should be a lot of optimism about fans should be talking about him just depends on how scott chooses to fit him in right because they don't really like they do a good job of game planning a relatively good job of game planning for receivers but they don't really do the same thing for tight ends necessarily they just kind of call their offense and run their offense so it'll be interesting to see um if they can find like a package or a, or a couple plays where he's the guy and they can kind of get him some targets because right now it's so funny like when he's in the red zone i don't have to watch anybody else because i know the quarterback's going to try and throw him the ball if he has any any meaningful type of route so i just focus on him and today i was four for four in terms of targets for him and he and he i think he won three of them so obviously that's the way they're mm-hmm. going and i think that speaks to what he does really well and um, and so people, fans should be excited about him. It just depends on how the rest of training camp goes, how he does when the pads come on. And then um, if Scott Turner kind of says, like, deems it appropriate to give this kid his own deal, which is a big ask for a rookie fifth round pick. So, yeah. Yeah, um, definitely looking forward to seeing what he can do in the red zone this upcoming year, if he can uh, get on the field and help out that way. Yeah. But tomorrow is a day that I've been looking forward to since training camp started, and that is they're putting the pads on tomorrow. So what would you be looking for as they put on the uh, pads for the first time in training camp? Well, so I think there's a couple of positions that I'm really interested in watching and then individuals within those positions. I think number one, numero uno, the big kahuna guy that I'm watching when pads come on is Jamin Davis. He is uh, he's a guy that I think has done a nice job during this offseason and I think is improved. But I think a lot of what he needs to improve on resides like and rests on when the pads come on. You know, how does he take on blocks? How does he make tackles? All those things. So as much as he's improved and as much as he looks better, I want to see how he looks when the pads come on. Another guy that I'm really excited to see is Brian Robinson. I think he's done a really nice job in kind of shorts and T-shirts, uh, you know, showing off his vision, showing off his explosive cutting ability. Um, I want to see if he's got the power that he had in college to back that up because I think he's a very, very talented runner. But those are both positions you can't truly evaluate until they get the football pads on. So that's one. And then the third guy I would say is Benjamin St. Juiced. There's been some talk about him taking over the full full mm-hmm. nickel role. So first and second down and third down. Mm-hmm. Um, Cam curl has been doing first and second down stuff predominantly in training camp so far. Uh, and so I'll be interested to see if, you know, like Ron said, perhaps he could be the full-time guy, Benjamin St. Juice, which would be great. Because I think you get a better football player on the field and you keep Cam in a position of consistency at the safety. So if he can handle the runs, if he can handle the fits, if he can handle taking on blocks, that'll be very, very telling in terms of what this defense can do. Absolutely. Now, Logan, to wrap this up, I only have a couple more questions for you. 
But Chase Ruye got activated off the pup list. Trey Turner, vice versa, got switched off. He's been sidelined with an injury. And then we've talked about you, you know, Carson Wentz not looking himself. He thought the pass rush was getting to him. So in that breath, how has the offensive line looked? Who has come in in replace of Trey Turner? And how has the interior done so far? Yeah, so I think you feel very good about the depth along the interior. The problem, I think, the biggest problem that no one's talking about at the moment is that Cornelius Lucas has not been at practice. And so what that does okay. to you is you're you're losing. So Leno is a vet. He has vet days. He hasn't practiced as often as everybody else. And so when he's on a pitch count, Cornelius Lucas comes in and the offense functions at a very high level. He's basically a starting left tackle in the NFL or right tackle in the NFL, depending on which team he would be going to. And then you look at the guard spots and you say, okay, I feel pretty good about it. But when Cornelius is out, then all of a sudden Sadiq Charles, who's really your starting guard or your first rotational guard, is now playing left tackle. Or Chris Paul is playing right tackle in rotational situations. And so those guys, which are are probably going to be guards and probably going to be pretty solid guards if they can figure it out, are now playing tackles. So you got guards playing tackles, then you get your third string guard playing guard. And I think that that's kind of problematic, obviously. So like when you start moving all these pieces around, and if you really look at that, it's not Trey Turner's out, it's not this, it's not that. Because if Trey Turner's out, Wes Schweitzer's playing guard. Right. And Wes Schweitzer can play guard fine, right? Chase Rulli is a fine center. Norwell has been Mr. City idiot left guard. Him and uh, John Allen have had some tremendous battles over the first five days of training camp. So that's something else to keep an eye on when the pads come on. Hey. But I think, but again, like, have not having Cornelius has really thrown a wrench in everything. They signed a new tackle yesterday. He practiced today for the first time. They're just looking for bodies to kind of fill out that spot. I don't know what's wrong with Cornelius. I don't know what's going on, but he's missed five days of practice. So that is becoming, again, one of those things that's indicative of something maybe more major. Okay. And it's something that I'm slightly concerned about because it, I've seen the effect it's had on the, on the group and how the rotation uh, occurs. So obviously um, they haven't been performing well. Today was much better. But they had a day a couple of days ago, the day that Trey Turner went out, where it was pretty rough. You know what I mean? A lot of guys not knowing what to do, a lot of guys getting reps that they shouldn't have been getting. And uh, you could see it on the field. So they, they seem to have righted the ship with Chase coming back. But I really think the, the biggest linchpin there in terms of the offensive line success for, for training camp purposes is Cornelius Lucas just because of the depth he provides. Did not, did not think that would be such a cog into things, Logan, but you explained it so right. perfectly well, and you're absolutely right. But yeah. now, we, you know, we talked about the defense kind of dominating, but yeah. Jahan Dotson has been dominating in his own right, obviously impressing yeah. a lot of people. So far, we're now we're a week into training camp. What are your thoughts on Jahan Dotson so far? I think Jahan's production has been great. Like I said, he had a nice catch today um, in the red zone. Really nice job. And uh, he's had a nice big catch explosive play every single day. Uh, I want to say on Saturday he had a couple of drops, which was a little uncharacteristic of him, but that's probably been his most inconsistent day of training camp. I think the thing that sticks out from OTAs and mini camp to now is the lack of separation he's getting. And that's, I think that's an adjustment by the defense more than anything. Okay. They kind of understand how he's running routes. They understand how he's setting stuff up. And I also think that, you know, we got to see him later in OTAs, kind of when the full route tree for the offense was in, and he could just toy with defensive backs. So right now, it's the windows are a little bit tighter. Benjamin St. Just has done a great job in terms of making it very challenging for him to win. And I also think that the offense is, um, I don't know if this is intentional, but it seems that they haven't installed all of their past concepts, right? They're kind of, they've got like probably 15 to 20 that they're kind of repping a lot right now. And I think that, you know, it doesn't bode well necessarily for the receivers in terms of route tree variety, but he's, he's been impressive. I think, um, you know, he's been a little bit, I don't know, more impressive, maybe like he's shown up more, let's just say than Terry, you know, Terry's had some very, very kind of uh, comprehensive battles with Kendall Fuller and um, William Jackson, the third, and hasn't quite found his legs yet after that big catch on day one. So again, like lots of things to improve on there, but I think John's done an excellent job and I think he will continue to do an excellent job. And I just hope to see kind of that separation, that dynamic separation we saw in OTAs show up again here in training camp at some point. Yeah. It's just because Terry is so good that by now it's just, that's just Terry being Terry. It doesn't blow you away anymore. Real real fast, Logan, before you leave, I know that I'm keeping you longer. I have one thing to ask you because I'm not going to ask Selby this one because he wouldn't, he wouldn't know, you know, you're the, you're the former NFL player. Uh, So Josh Allen with the bills, he he got into it with the defender, of course, when he was running a quarterback draw up the middle, he got hit. Did anything like that ever happen with you, uh, like with Washington or, or with any other teams where a quarterback got hit during camp and it just started a big scuffle? And how does that kind of affect the team? I mean, you know, when you're in the NFL, especially when I first got in, like anything could start a fight, like literally anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, wrong? No, like I so like, for example, like um, I, I was running down the field on a block, you know, working on my cardio, running backs running away and I just kind of bumped somebody. 
And the guy who was Macari Rambo turned around and swung on me, right? I remember Macari Rambo. <laughs> and so, Scary guy. And so, Anybody with the last name Rambo. Nope. And so then, obviously, like, <laughs> that, you know, it was like a nothing thing that leads right. to, like, a big fight. Because then all the DBs come over and everyone starts yelling at each other. And then the rest of the practice, it's like, uh, but if, I swear, if you touched a quarterback like that in practice, like, you better Even if watch they out. want to draw up the middle, you, be, you like, better you better mean every second of it because somebody, right. especially if he's well <laughs> if he's well liked on the team, like when Robert was at the peak of his powers in 2012, if anybody touched him, any oh single God. human being, right. he would have been murdered by the O line on the spot. <laughs> so I think that that's something again, like especially in training camp, tempers are a little high, everyone gets a little edgy, everyone's a little tired, a little sore. It doesn't take a lot to get someone to lose their cool. Like I remember getting in a fight. With D'Angelo, because I thought he pushed me too hard out of bounds on a play. What did you, you do? Did I mean? you tear his Achilles? No, so I ran over. Oh, that was DeAndre his... Hopkins. I'm sorry. Oh my God! Look at you, bro. Let that man rest in peace. Daddy came out swinging <laughs> today. Jeez, man, Cog, it's your boy right now. I try. I what try. is he doing? Dude, I, I wrote. You said. You said. Uh, this is just how. What weird mood I'm in. You said something about Rivera looking for bodies. <laughs> looking for bodies. Yeah, you're talking about the O line. And I oh wrote, yeah i wrote sports <laughs> sports are weird because it's the only time you can say <laughs> Rivera, rivera's looking for rivera's looking for bodies and not have police searching the woods <laughs> by the mexico border rita's over here having the time of his life i know rita's I crushing even, it today. he's in his own world right now. <laughs> I don't know what I'm, uh, I don't know hey what logan I'm real quick before you get out of here one last question for you uh you interviewed cam curl today on the show he also had a pick in practice and he also took a more leadership role. You could say that's something that Rivera was requesting of him. And he talked about that in his interview with you guys. What is your, what is your thought on Cam Curl so far in camp? Not only him as a person, but on the field as well. Yeah. I mean, he's, I think he's kind of put himself in position for a really solid year. I, I, I like, I like him. I like him a lot as a player. I like him a lot as a person, like in the interview, like you get a feel for how guys are. He's just got a quiet confidence about him. Like a guy who, is he going to get it caught up in all the hoopla and all the, the fanfare. He's just like, I'm here to play football and, and be a good football player. And that's what he's doing. And he's, and he's done an excellent job of that. And so that's something that um, I have a ton of respect for. And then he's backed it up on the field. He's in the right position. He ran down Gibson today in the goal line situation and probably would have tackled him for a loss again. Like he just shows up consistently every day, kind of set your watch by him. You don't have to worry about him. I don't have to watch him even in practice that much because I know that he's kind of doing the right thing mm -hmm. and I can check out other guys. So a um, lot of respect for him. I'm expecting big things from him. Um, and I think he's got the physical skill set to get that done and play at a really high level. So I'm, I'm very excited to see, you know, what he does when pads come on and what he does maybe throughout the preseason if he plays. I don't think he will, but if he does, keep an eye out for him. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Logan, for joining us again. You can find Logan on Instagram at Logan underscore Paulson 82. And then you can also find his podcast, the Take Command Podcast with Logan Paulson. Can't thank you enough, brother, as always. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you. It was Have a fun a one night. today, boys. Yes, sir. Get Mike some in rare there. form. I'll see you guys. <laughs> I, I'm sorry for them. You know? All right, Logan. Have a good one. All right, everybody. We just talked to the busiest man in Washington, Mr. Logan Paulson. He is. Uh, he's doing more than Biden right now. That's for sure. Let's get into politics. <laughs> <Dude>. <laughs> yeah, let's get into politics. <laughs> no, but <laughs> let me just say that joke without laughing real quick. That's, that's a pretty good joke right there uh, that – Sports are weird because it's the only time you can say that Rivera is looking for bodies and not have the police searching the woods by the Mexico border. That's a pretty, that's a pretty that's good, a good one. That was a good joke <laughs> that's a, that's that you had. It was, the comedic timing was there. But before we get yeah. into our next guest and then ultimately fan questions to wrap up this show, Curtis Samuel, obviously everyone is kind of flipping out about it. And I think that, I think honestly, I'm, I'm not, not sure if I'm under, I think Logan really gave us some good info there that not, not many yeah. people would. And I think that anybody that watches this show, I think that you are in a very blessed to be able to hear what he said. And basically, there is something going on here, and it is concerning. So, zero out of 10, Hall, what's your thought process here? How concerned are you? Man, uh, I was kind of like Logan, where I was like optimistic, even like you guys already know, like. Going back to two years ago when we were talking about like we need someone. You were always Terry. talking about signing him. Yeah, I was always the one like Curtis Samuel's the perfect fit. I knew he was like really good friends with Terry going back to Ohio State and stuff like that. So I just knew he would connection. be the perfect number two here, especially with Scott Turner who actually like Rivera. They know his skill set. Yeah. And then uh, fast forward to last year again, I was another kind of like optimistic like oh you know like he'll get he'll get right he'll get better he'll get back on the field at some point, and then he couldn't practice like two days in a row. So I was like, oh, well, OK, bounce back here. We saw him at OTAs and stuff. He was in good spirits. He was looking really fast out there doing his thing. So I'm like, all right, this is the bounce back year. 
everyone was going like talking cra uh, crap about him before, like or, uh, after last year. Here's the bounce back year to prove all the haters wrong. And once again, he cannot put more than two practices together. So with that being said, my concern is definitely an eight. I think Logan's right. Definitely think it's definitely something a little bit more serious. And I know people are just like, oh, it's just training camp. Like, I just want him there for week one. Well, what good is it if he's out there for week one, but then not from weeks two to 17 and 18. So hopefully he can get back out there and get right, because I think he's a huge part for this offense. But like everyone else has pretty much said for the past like year and a half now, anything you get out of him at this point is a bonus. So you just got to act like he's not there. He's got to steal my line as soon as I'm mm -hmm. about to go. And my, exactly. My worry level. You is steal my same. fancy football players. I got to steal your line. Damn. You don't stop. steal anybody. <laughs> I I would say I'm at a zero, man. I've said this for a while now, what? and it's, and it's no disres and it's no you disrespect, crazy. no disrespect to Curtis. But the fact is, is that anything that he does is a bonus at this point for me. Why are you stealing my lines? And so, mm. like, let's just look. I understand what everyone is saying, and yeah, it would be a positive to have him on the field, and it is concerning. But at the same point, we just need the guy healthy. And so I, I'm not concerned about it. We have saw how they did for 17 games. If DeAndre Carter could kind of make a name for himself as a wide receiver, I think these other guys can easily step in and be able to do that as well. But the health is obviously a big concern there. We have Diami Brown and others that can come in and do it. So I am not concerned. I just want Curtis Samuel healthy, and hopefully that happens sooner or later. What do you think, Reed? I mean, I'm not going to be a Lindsay Lohan and start stealing lines like you guys. But, <laughs> but uh, no, I've, after hearing him talk, like I, I've always, oh I've always tried to like look at. I'm a class half full kind of gal. You guys know that, so like I always try to look at the positive with him. And uh, and now after hearing that, it's just like, yeah, there's definitely something going on because it's it's just too much and it's frustrating. And I know that those injuries can linger and they they can be you really need to take some time away. I figured that this off season would be enough, but if he aggravated it, then it's going to start a whole new thing. So I just want him to get better. Uh, but like you said, anything at this point is, is a bonus. I think that's was the words you guys used. Uh, so I'm just, yeah, I mean, I'm, a, I'm at like an eight though, you know, I mean, which is impressive because the other day somebody called me a four, but I, think they were talking about <laughs> I, out of five. I get your zero. I get your zero because like you said, like you just, anything you get from is extra like gravy on top of the mashed potatoes. But my only reason on my eight is because very detailed. Yeah. That was thank you. I'm actually kind of hungry right now. KFC. Um, <laughs> only reason I'm at an eight is because are we sure that Deami Brown can do it? Because he hasn't really shown you coming out of last year that he actually can do it. Obviously, quarterback might have factored into Deami's, I guess, floor for last year. But are we like sure that Deami can do it? Obviously, everyone likes Cam Sims and thinks that he can step in and kind of be that guy, but. For whatever reason, the coaching staff doesn't see him as that guy because they don't give him any type of playing time for the most part on offense. So that's the only reason I'm at an eight. Obviously, Jahan Dotson being there kind of relieves some of that, or else yeah. I'd probably be at a 10 because it would literally just be the same as last year with just Terry and like no one else. So like you guys said, hopefully he gets healthy and gets out there, but – Got to sh got to see it to uh, believe it at this point. I was honestly. I was about to say if we didn't draft Jahan Dotson, that this would be like a doom or gloom situation. Like this would be like, all right, well our offensive season is going to be ruined. But uh, now yep. with Jahan, at least you feel good. You, you still feel comfortable. So. Yeah. So my line of thinking there was that basically because what DeAndre Carter did last season with Taylor Heineke and made himself a name in the wide receiver room, you could say that Diami Brown with an upgraded quarterback is going to be able to do the same thing naturally. Is basically what I was saying at the end yeah, of it all. Yeah. But now we are joined by our next guest, which is the man, the staff writer for the Commanders, Mr. Zach Selby. You know, we had the busiest man in in Washington with Logan Paulson on earlier, but now we are joined by the second busiest man in Washington, Mr. Zach Selby. How are you doing, sir, on this fantastic and beautiful Monday? Well, um, I am very, very, I find myself very fortunate because it has been uh, very nice outside in terms of like weather-wise whenever we're at practice because normally it's like, hot as all get out yeah but today it was you know there was a nice little overcast it was feeling a little cool with the breeze um and of course as soon as we get out of practice it just blares down sun so but mm -hmm. luckily you know things are going okay so far you know busy that's, but okay yeah that's a, that's a good thing though it did it when you left you know that means oh, yeah. god's looking out for you nice. somebody <laughs> is <laughs> somebody is absolutely now selby my first question for you 
made some waves on Twitter and all on social media, but Ryan Kerrigan re- signed with the Commanders, retired as a Commander, and now has basically taken a role as an intern coach. You could say he's trying it out for a couple weeks. That's what Ron Rivera said in his presser today, and they're going to just see down the line if, if Ryan wants to continue going into coaching. So what was your reaction to that move? And then do you, what, do you, what have you seen out of Ryan Kerrigan at practice? You know, not that much yet. Um, I know he's going to be there for the rest of practice, but I'm not surprised by it. Um, you know, he told me um, that he really wants to get involved in that. I mean, he he was kind of like on the fence about it back when he was playing. I uh, didn't know if he really wanted to do it. But now as he's kind of ingratiated himself out of the game, he's like, you know what? I kind of miss it. Uh, I've kind of missed the fact of, you know, being out there with the guys and, you know, teaching and everything, which is kind of what he was doing you know, back in 2020, helping Montez Sweat and Chase Young and all these young defensive ends learn a little bit more about, you know, how to how to be an effective pass rusher because he mm-hmm. certainly did a lot of that, you know, in his days here. Um, I think I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I do know that he was kind of helping Montez Sweat a little bit with, uh, with a move he used to do, um, like an open-under move he used to do back here and uh, how, to, how to kind of incorporate that a little bit. But he's mostly watching, surveying, um, and actually giving a little bit of tips here and there. But – uh, I'm curious to see how he how he likes it. I mean, it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me. He seems like he'd be a natural for it. But. Oh yeah, I completely agree. Um, so as you know, I mean, you were you were there. The secondary whew, secondary balled out today. It, it, from what it sounds like, it's something finally clicking with them. Would, would you say? Of course, after last year, we know the struggles that they had. But would you say that this is more of a testament of the secondary just kind of getting getting their wings, or is it more just Carson being Carson and having its inconsistencies? Well, I think, you know, the, the offense generally is a little bit behind the defense. That's why it does with, like, every single training camp at every single right. team because, you know, the defense is just – they're a little bit farther ahead because the – That's what Logan are, said, too. So yeah, good exactly. For you. Yeah, and I've been, t- I've been speaking with old Logan about this. Oh, uh, so we're, we're okay. in the thing. Uh, but, no, I think – You I guys think aren't getting too close, though, are you? Oh, no. I That's mean, my best friend. Okay. Right, just making sure. <laughs> <Hang on. laughs> Chill. <laughs> no, but but really though, I think you know it's a little bit of both. Right, I think it's still the offense is still coming along, but I think it's also the defense is looking pretty good. I mean, it, it's very refreshing because you hear you know all the way back in June about from whether it's William Jackson, it's uh, you know St. Juice, Fuller, McCain. They've all been talking about how I mean this communication in secondary has just gotten so much better. I mean, William Jackson said on Saturday it's a thousand percent better. Um, and it looks like, I mean, it's so refreshing to see that they actually is the case because it's not just a lot of talk, right? I mean, they've mm-hmm. actually gone out in the field and, and backed it up, uh, because I mean, I mean, a lot of the plays that they made were just spectacular. Uh, I think, you know, the, the play that Fuller made, um, against, uh, Cam Sims was just really a great play. It was really a great play. Cause I mean, you know, he hit Cam and the numbers Wentz did, but you know, when, uh, Fuller is a, Fuller is a, is a very, very exceptionally good corner for a reason um and you have you know a lot of you know young guys like percy percy butler out there getting getting a pick and i think it's it's a good sign for what this what this defense can be now keep in mind i mean it is against an offensive thing that a lot of the players already know very well and on top of that they're doing a lot of basic stuff there's only five days into camp so they're not you know just gonna do 400 500 level stuff heading into you know the start of week two um, but I think the pads is the pads is going to be a very good uh, indicator of how that's going to look whenever that comes on on Tuesday, and then the first preseason game. I think seeing it actually against another team on the field is really going to tell you how good the secondary is. It's a little bit of a cliche thing to say, but it's really true. No, um, yeah. So I think you know, now that said, I mean we all we would all be making a big deal about it if the secondary wasn't doing a lot of right. these things, yeah. right? <laughs> they were more just doing all that other stuff. But I think it's you know so far it's all signs are pointing in the right direction. Definitely, definitely a good thing. Um, so everyone knows about like the big name guys like Carson Wentz, John Dotson, Cole Turner having standout kind of practices and sessions during 909, 11-11s. Who's someone that's been a, kind of a standout in camp that the fan base doesn't really know a lot about or hear a lot about? It's a very good question because a lot of the normal stars really have like stood out a lot. Uh, I think, I think, you know, the, the bottom of the receiver that the receiver position is one that I've been looking at pretty heavily. 
Um, because Rivera has said, you know, that, that five, six, seven spot is going to be very competitive. And I think Dax Milne has really, like, he's kind of put a little bit of a hold on that um, so far. So I think, you know, anytime you, anytime you throw to him, it seems like he just makes the catch. Like, he just mm-hmm. has the ability to just come down with the ball. He's got very good route running. He's, he knows how to get open and, like, you know, five, seven yards away from the line of scrimmage. And, you know, he, I mean, he's just reliable. I mean, there's no other way to say it. And I think, you know, if he can come in and be, you know, that that fifth guy, fifth slot guy, you know, maybe even the sixth slot guy who can come in and just kind of get a little bit of a first down, keep the chain moving every now and again, that's what you want out of, like, you know, a seventh round pick. And I think uh, that's going to be very interesting to see. Uh, Mark and Michelle and the other guy I'm kind of watching after what he did in OTAs had a couple of drops today. But, I mean, I think overall he's still a very talented player. Absolutely. You know, you know what else Dax Milne's starting to hold down is uh, Zach Wilson's girl. <laughs> you know, no, 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 I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say you can, you can have to ask Dax about that. That's <laughs> about that. Yeah. yeah. If we ever, if we ever see Dax, I'm sure we I'd will. be too scared. To uh, but I know you only have a little <laughs> bit of time here, uh, Selby. So I have a couple more questions for you. The kick slash punt returner position. How has that fared out? What guys have competed for it? And is there anybody that has separated themselves in that position? Yeah, you know, this is a position battle I've been kind of been keeping an eye on over the past few days. And it looks like, you know, when they first started returning punts, um, there were five guys out there. There was you know, Alex Erickson, McGowan, there was Ezard, uh, Dotson, and Mill. And, uh, and Mil. Now, and, and Patterson was also out there with kickoff returns. Uh, so that's like six, seven guys. Uh, with now, today, they went through and it's been, looks like there were only three guys out there, which was Dotson, McGowan, and Erickson. And I mean, Dawson has, you know, he has a resume uh, back at Penn State for being a pretty good return guy. Um, Erickson, you know, I, I don't really know too much about what he does in returning. And I think, you know, I think uh, McGowan is trying to make his case that he can do be more than just, you know, you know, that seventh guy. He can be a little bit, he has that position flexibility and versatility uh, to come in here and help out the team a little bit. Um, but I mean, the Dawson thing is interesting because I don't know how much they really want to put him out there. Um, you know, I, I mean, if he has the ability to do it, sure. Um, but I think, you know, I think Milne has also shown he has the ability to do so. I think he caught a couple, couple, couple punts, uh, back in the preseason last year. Um, so we'll see how that goes. I think if they, if they really want, you know, for the, the high risk high reward, you go with Dotson. Right. Mm-hmm. So that kind of reminds me of a uh, Deshaun Jackson years ago. I, I feel like they might use him in that kind of role where like, if you need a big punt return, you're going to put. Uh, Jahan Dotson back there, but you don't want to have him back there every return because I mean it's a nice little wrinkle. Wrinkle. It's a yeah, wrinkle. It's a wrinkle you exactly. can have if you really want to use it. Right. Absolutely. Now, one of the draft picks, Chris Paul, the offensive lineman, has gotten a lot of snaps recently in camp, and this is a good defensive line. So, how has the offensive line of Chris Paul looked so far, Zach? I mean, I think Chris Paul is, is is like a lot of guys right now. They're getting a lot of different looks. And that's the thing, one thing that John Masco is very good at. He's getting a lot of, like, rotations and everything because if you think about it, last year there were about – I mean, can you count on one hand how many different offensive line rotations they had, right. you know, the starting line during the season? And so it's good to get all these snaps together in right now. Um, you know, as Chase really kind of gets back into the lineup, that guard position is going to be shake, uh, shaking up even more. But I think Chris is, is doing everything that he would – that he needs to be doing. I think he still has some technique things to work on. Um, but for the most part, he's doing, you know, he's being, he's being a rookie to learning and growing and everything. Um, you know, I think, you know, I say, I saw Leno have a pretty good play against uh, Montez Sweat today. Uh, nine on nine drills. I think you know, they, they're having their moments. But it's also really hard to judge an offensive line or a defensive line right now, because I mean, there's only so much you can do with no contact and like contact is 98% of, right. of what all the linemen do. So I think tomorrow when the pads come on, that's going to be a really good indicator of who were this were those those the, those two deep and the ten are going to be really are going to be at right now. Uh, the one on one pass rush is going to be pretty key. Um, you know, seeing what they do like in in the run game, we act, when you're actually able to hit somebody a little bit. That's going to be a big deal. Being able to open up some of the running lanes instead of more of like it's like uh, I guess you could say that the holes open up in the run game when there's no pads, but like it's it's more of like it's a concept. Like yeah, the hole's going to be there, but you know. Um, at the end of the day, like it's not because there's no pads out there. <laughs> <laughs> now, Selby, my last question for you. This is one. This one is for my boy, Mr. Michael Reed. Talk to me about Samus Thick Reyes, please. Yeah. How has he He's looked from last year to this year? Have you seen a transformation? Do you think that this past week he's actually made a name for himself to possibly make the roster? 
I think possibly make the roster is is the emphasis here, right? right. Because if you look at it, like the, the first three are pretty locked in, right? I mean, and it depends on, you know, whenever Logan Thomas comes off the pup list. If he comes off during the pup list during training camp, uh, I mean, that probably hurts Samus's chances a, a little bit more. But if he comes off, if he waits to come off during the season, there might be a chance there. But say for, for all intents and purposes, we'll just say Logan Thomas lock, uh, Bates lock, Cole Turner lock. That's three guys. They can, I think they kept three, maybe four yeah. last year. So you have one spot. And I think in terms of Samus, he, he has gotten better. I think he's, he's, been more of a hands catcher recently. You know, a lot of his catches last year were were in his body. Uh, you know, he had. A, I remember a couple of those those juggle passes he had. Uh, you know, during the preseason. Yeah. But you know, he's he's a better route runner. He's gotten some action with the first team. Uh, but again, like they're they're running in a lot of different like combinations in there. Um, okay. similar, in a similar fashion with the offensive line. Um, but I think his best shot to make the roster is still to prove his, to prove himself on special teams and to see if he can block. Cause then he's, he's doing a lot of that. He's still a pretty physical guy. He's still a very good blocker. Um, but the pass catching is, is what's going to see if he can, what's going to be the indicator, see if he can actually like make a better role on the team. And I know they, they still think a lot about him. They still think he has a lot of tools. I mean, my God, like you look at him and he's just still a physical specimen. That's what uh, attracted me to him. Like that's what <laughs> brought my eyes to him. That's what made me like him is his physical tools. I, I got you. I got you. Yeah. He's got a lot of them tools. Um, Nobody better. <laughs> but no, I think, um, I think, you know, I think Curtis Hard Curtis Hodges might have a little bit of a step on him right now because he's been looking really good too, but we'll see how it goes. I mean, we're still, we're still in the start of week two of camp and we still got three preseason games to go. So we'll see. Yeah. If there's anything guaranteed this life is that Reed is not getting an invite on command the crews. The new cruise line that the team is talking about. They will not let that guy on it in close shape. But Selby, I can't thank you enough for joining us. Sir. I know you've been very, very busy. you got a lot to do covering training camp every day. I'm sure it's very, very tiring. I can't thank you enough for joining us, sir. Until next time, I appreciate all your work, sir. Absolutely. I appreciate all y'all's work, and y'all have a great and stupendous day. Yes, sir, and yes, I'll, see you, I'll see you on Selby. Friday, brother. All right, man. I'll see y'all. Yes. All right, Selby. All right, everybody. Why wouldn't just... I be invited onto this cruise? Is Samus going to be there? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Just in case the possibility is there, they can't allow that kind of liability to exist. Okay, if they if they let Bruce Allen near the cheerleaders, they'll allow me near Samus. <laughs> you couldn't even finish it. You New couldn't people even finish it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right, let's wrap up this episode, boys, with some fan questions. And we can't start with anyone else other than the Colonel. And this is going to you, Reed. Any chance Ryan Kerrigan unretires and returns to Washington in the absence of Chase, even if only for a few games, to retire as a Washington commander? He says it's a goofy question. He knows. As a as much as I love where your head is at, and as much as I would love to see Ryan Kerrigan in a commander's jersey, I'm gonna give that about a one percent chance of happening. I, it's not gonna happen. I wish it would. I would love to see him in this new uni, uh, but no, it's not gonna happen. I think he, he's done. He said he knew he was done uh, a little while ago, so I think he's set on it. He's looking to go somewhere else, and hey, he deserves it. Yeah, and I listened to his um, interview essentially with the press conference with his retirement, and it's not is uh, the reason why I'm saying no to this colonel isn't because I don't think the commanders would reach out to Kerrigan. I think a lot of his decision had to go with his injury. He talked about he was thinking about in- retiring last off season, but it, the way his injury was going down, he wanted to test it out just to prove that he could do it. And basically, what he got at the beginning of the summer was it's done basically with the injury, and there's no reason to kind of stress that. And so I think because of the injury, I don't think it's a very high chance of that happening. They have other guys that they could possibly bring in. And I think the one thing about Ryan Kerrigan is the Ryan Kerrigan type of player is the type of guy that is a great coach because he's not physically gifted. He's not fast. He's not the strongest guy ever, but he knows what to do. And those type of guys generally are able to translate information very, very well to another person. So I do think that Ryan Kerrigan will excel. If he, I think he'll be a better coach than he was as a player, if that makes and any that's sense. that's saying something because he was a hell of a player. Yeah, yeah uh, definitely agree with what you just said. I definitely think that uh, if he does decide to stay for after training camp and actually like continue to coaching a little bit this season – uh, I definitely think that Montez and that D-line and Chase, whenever he gets back, are going to benefit hugely, almost like the 2020 season, because they're going to have Ryan Kerrigan in there 
kind of showing them that technique and kind of just in their ear, kind of like talking to them, motivating them, like looking at uh, looking at the still pictures on the sidelines, like, hey, if he presents you with this, hit him with this move type of thing. So right. definitely going to be a huge benefit if he, if he decides to stay with us. But I just want to give a shout out to uh, all the people last year that were just so butthurt that they cut Ryan Kerrigan or didn't bring him back after his contract expired. They had foresight. Clearly, clearly like they, they knew what was going on, which was he was thinking about retirement anyway. So shout out to y'all trying to kill the coaching staff and get everyone fired because they didn't want to resign Ryan Kerrigan on a legacy contract. That's uh, what's it's a business do. decision. You got to make honestly, business decisions. That is something this team like loves. I know that we love our players exactly. and everything, but sometimes we do keep guys longer here than we should. I know one thing that triggered me this morning, I was thinking about it, was D'Angelo Hall saying that ATL was his home. You know, he loved repping, talking about Matt Ryan and stuff. Well, how come he didn't get a job with the ATL broadcast team? Right. You know, how come he wasn't in that area getting to get into the NFL network, but you have no problem saying that's your hometown? No, yeah. I'm just tired of players coming here, like, using the fan base, using this area just to prop themselves up. And then thinking that, like, we need to give them something in reciprocation. You know what I mean? It's just, it yeah. rubs don't, me the wrong way. Don't make me call DeAndre Hopkins D Hall. I don't know what a D Hall <laughs> like. He's completely rubbed us all wrong lately. You know? I yeah. like D Hall a lot. I man. like the guy. But I like, like D Hall too. Shut up. He's a Virginia everyone Tech like, boy. You know? Everyone started killing him because he was like taking like some stance against the organization, didn't right. like what was going on, but whatever he was saying now, which I get. I mean, that's your opinion. And you can do what right. you want to do. But. And he stepped away from the broadcast thing because he didn't like what was going on behind the scenes. All I'm going to say is you've been around this organization for so long. You don't. Right. This, this is, is where you draw the line. It is where you drew the line. It wasn't, at. It wasn't with Bruce and, and them. <laughs> I heard him talking about how like oh Carson Wentz is like bad and they should have just stepped with stick with Heineke, blah blah blah. And then literally after getting obliterated by the whole fan base over the past couple of months, I heard him on NFL Network the other day saying, "Oh, you know that's my former team. Like I think they're going to have a great season this year. Carson's going to do very well." And I'm like. It's not what you were saying when you were here. Dude, he literally right? said when he when he announced that he was leaving, whatever, he literally said they didn't do anything to get improved this season. Do you remember exactly. that? I even asked yeah. Selby about it. I said, do you have a comment on that? And he said, no, I don't have a comment on yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Now so, he's flip-flopping because right. everyone was I will. I will say shout out to D. Hall. He's he's a nice guy. He's he, friend of the show. He's been he on is the a very show. nice guy. My seventh cousin I twice removed. Now, it's just, bro. It's oh, just yeah, when, he did, when he did talk crap about them, it was like he was very, like saying stuff like they haven't improved at all is like where I draw the line of caring. Because like now I'm pissed off, okay? Now you're just exactly. making stuff up to pump it up because it's easy to make fun of the Commander's Nation, and you're just doing it to get your name he out. Looks trying like to, exactly, trying to pile on, get his name out right. there because everyone else is already piling right. on. Like, no, but let's let's get over that. Let's stop with the negativity. Next question. <laughs> this is nice from guy. our guy Jeff Miles. He asks, "What can we expect for the open practice on Saturday at FedEx Field?" He says he's never been there before. Never been to FedEx or just no open the practice? open practice that was there last season. I don't think you guys went either. Yeah, I, was, I didn't go last year, but uh, I'm gonna assume it's gonna be you like want me to training camp, like training camp where they're gonna have like individual drills on the field. They'll probably do uh, some nine on nine scrimmaging, some eleven on eleven scrimmaging. Uh, I don't know how long exactly it is, but you, you probably only fit like certain amount of like practice time in that certain amount of time. And I don't think they want to like. They're on the home field. I don't, I don't think they're going to be going, like, super hard. I am kind of psyched, though, because I'm going to have the pads on. So that's something I'm looking forward to is uh, just a lot of uh, a lot of pad cracking on the FedEx field. Yeah. Um, so what you should expect, Jeff, is essentially that this is going to be like practice. They're going to do individual drills. It's going to be kind of boring at, four, at first and everything. But you want to pay attention to the 11-on-11s when they actually put the guys out there. You want to pay attention to individuals that are standing out there at first because you want to see who they're trying out in certain packages. You know, be able to say where William is, where Kendall is. Be able to fit those guys in, and then you'll be able to see basically what's going on with the play. But just have fun. It's going to be practice. Basically, going to be like a game, except your your seats are going to be much closer to the field. Uh, it's going to be much more personal. Uh, it's you're going to be able to say stuff to the players. You're you're going to be able to uh, get the crowd to get the players into it when they do stuff. It's it's a lot of fun. Make sure you get out there. Last year they had like a band set up around the stadium, so you could walk around the stadium and see things and other stuff like that. So make sure you get out there early and just have fun, man. That's all it's about. Yeah, yeah. When you uh yeah like i said i didn't go last year but uh like they said i think you're probably gonna end up seeing like a a 
a little kid walking with two parents in an alleyway and they're both going to get shot and that kid's going to grow up surrounded by bats and he's probably going to end up being a superhero. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, that's with Batman. This? That's not open practice. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know what to expect. I've never seen it. Hall, let's go to this next question to you. This is Big Tony Shivers. Without the Shazier Everett, who do you think is a good candidate for the special teams captain? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh... I think Percy Butler might take over that that role as like the special teams captain. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. I know he was like heralded as like a really good gunner, like because of his speed and everything like that. And I know they want to they're really high on him and want to like work him in slowly but surely. So, what better way than to get him on the field as a captain, a special teams captain, and then eventually if he starts making some plays, making some tackles, build his confidence up on special teams, you can put him in some sub packages on defense, and then hopefully the next thing you know, he's the next great guy back there with Bobby McCain and Cam Curl making plays. So, uh, yeah, I guess that's what you're going to – that's how I think it'll be. I think it'll be Percy Butler. And there's only one person that should get this, and it's Tressway. Well, Tress- I was going to say Tress, but that was like the obvious answer. Like, Tressway, like, yeah. he's a special teams captain. I mean, it, <laughs> he has to be. And he's like the old – one of the most – I'm not going to say old – veteran players on this, on this <laughs> team. Been here for a long time. He should be setting the tone – for the special teams, if you want to set the tone, shouldn't it be Tressway? I mean, if you're talking about consistency, that's the guy you want to follow. It's Tressway. Right. So you guys took both of mine. So then the next one I would probably say would be Joey Sly. However, I'm going to go somewhere completely different out of nowhere. And uh, this person's going to have to do this to stick around on this team as he's done in the past. And uh, he has potential using his size and length to be a fantastic gunner. And that's Cam Sims, baby. Cam Sims yeah, is a freak a of one. nature. He, he, he can make some plays. And if he can go out there and kind of assert his dominance – then I, I could see him making some noise. That's a great question, Tony. Thank you, brother. Yeah. This next one is from Andy Lockhart in the Discord chat server. Oi! In the UK. Oi. Deshaun Watson's six-game suspension. In my opinion, it's a disgrace. He got so few games suspended. What are your thoughts on him and the length of the dis- suspension? Hall, go first, because I, I know you're going to out something. <laughs> I was actually surprised nobody went crazy on Twitter when I posted that earlier. So I'm actually psyched because I have a lot of work to do today and didn't have time to be looking at my phone every five seconds. <laughs> but, uh, look, you, know, you already know how I feel about Deshaun Watson, like, as a football player, not as, like, the guy off the field that does, like, weird, creepy things. But as a football player, like, you already know. I was like – and – I didn't know it was going to be six games, but I also kind of thought that, like, they wouldn't give him a whole year, going back to, like, when all this stuff was, like, being talked about months ago. I didn't think they would give him a whole year. I thought it would be somewhere between 10 to 12 games. And my only, like, rationale behind this whole thing was not that I don't care about the victims and I hate women and all whatever else everyone was going to try to kill me for, was a 10 to, 10, 10 to 12 game suspension for one year would be worth four to five high-level franchise quarterback play especially for a team that's been star for a franchise quarterback. Now, obviously, you can factor in, like, well, if he would have came here, would the suspension been more because everything else going on here and everything like that, you know what I'm saying? So there's obviously different factors to it. From just strictly a football perspective, my only rationale was 10 to 12 game suspension, which ended up being six, which is crazy. But also, the amount of games is really, like, trivial to, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, there was going to be not enough amount of games suspended to please anybody unless it was like indefinite or like a year plus. So 10 to 12 games was my rationale of like, okay, he suspended 10 to 12 games. You play him for the last X amount of the part of the season and then you build, or you're having a good season before that. He even adds more to it on top of it. But now you have the position set for the next four or five years plus as a franchise guy, a young guy. But like I said, I knew it wasn't going to happen because everything else was going on. It's just that was my whole rationale of fo- strictly football, nothing else. Don't go crazy on my Twitter. I know my handle's right there on the screen, but uh, just strictly football perspective, I think he would have been a huge fit here, but also you know like socially and off the field and all the other stuff, why it wouldn't have worked out. So long story short, am I blown? They didn't really sign him. No, but then like, would I have been blown if they signed him and they gave him six game suspension? And then he came back to play this year and led us to the playoffs. No. And I'm sure just like a lot of people that have been in the stands, they would have been cheering him on because they would be winning games most likely. And that's yeah. all I'm going to say. Look, I'm not going to say it's a d- disgrace because I think there's layers to this. Nothing is as simple um, as it's made to be. I know a lot of people are bringing up the Calvin Ridley thing, Andy. And I understand that. But you have to look at the NFL like a Jenga setup, right? The blocks, the game that you play. And – 
the kind of making the the league fake by saying the leagues are the games are fixed, players are betting on this. That destroys the integrity of the game and therefore would destroy the league because then you're losing the authenticity of the league. You're, it's going to rot it from the inside and out. You're also losing all that gambling money that's been so, associated so with the league So you have to look well. at it as a, the outside Jenga piece. You'd never want to pull the outside Jenga piece, right? You want the middle piece. The outside will topple everything over, and that's the kind of thing that Calvin Ridley would breed into because a lot of people wouldn't question what the NFL comes out with, and they cannot have that because that is a very slippery slope into oblivion. Now with Deshaun Watson, unfortunately, as, as terrible, horrendous, and as bad of a look that is for Deshaun Watson in the NFL, that's not something that's going to crumble the NFL, if that makes sense in the long road. This is not something that's foreign, and obviously there is an issue in society with it altogether, but the fact is, I don't think it's a disgrace. They just have to be able to look at this with a logical sound and logical mind to say, what is going to rot us out from the inside out? And it's easy to be able to differentiate the two. That being said, I do think last season had a lot to do with the suspension. Looking at this from Deshaun Watson's aspect, Deshaun Watson was the only person that was in that room. Everyone else doesn't know what happened there with all these accusers. They have no idea what happened. And so I understand why you guys feel that way, but we also have to be logical in the same point say, I can't make a justification because I was not there. We don't know everything. These are just accusations, and we have to be cognizant of that. I just hope that everyone just doesn't jump to uh, conclusions so quickly. My goodness. Yeah, no, that's that's the thing is it's like obviously what he did was worse than – <clears throat> what Calvin Ridley did, but you're right. I mean, Calvin Ridley's affects the integrity of the game. Deshaun Watson's, as messed up as they are, they are accusations at this point. I mean, nothing's been proven in a court of law, so it's. I get it. I, I do think it's a little soft, but at the same, it. I mean, it is what it, I get. Why he would get more? It's kind of like with the Stephen Ross and Dan Snyder thing going on. Like Stephen Ross, right. that was kind of a bigger deal to owners because that affected the integrity of the game. Yep. Meanwhile, Dan Snyder, yeah, what he did was obviously worse. But when it comes to actual football, I mean, it, it's that doesn't really affect the game. Yeah, uh, imagine kids. Do you think kids are going to be as excited about football knowing it's fake? I know that you guys are wrestling fans, and I get it. I'm not saying there's <laughs> nothing, anything wrong with it. I'm just saying the differentiation in the intake of the fan base. You know, when you get that fake label, it's still hard for the NBA to walk away from it. You know, right. people still claim that the NBA is uh, – is false and is all f- fixed and everything. Well, the lottery is well, definitely fixed. But also, uh, also like you got to think about, like you said, the integrity, all that stuff, is hundred percent valid. And also, cash rules everything in society and in this world, and especially in big corporation types like the NFL, where these owners are getting these new sponsorships from all these new sports books, all this new revenue streaming money is coming in, and they're just like, oh, our pockets are getting even fatter now. So if you got guys and players betting on games, then that's going to force other people to be like, well, if everything seems fixed and rigged, why would I go out and spend my money on right. betting on games, which results in owners losing money, which right. results in, again, the owners being like, what is going on here? We got to make an example out of this guy. Right. Again, like you said, obviously Calvin Ridley's, what he did is not even mini school. It's like a dot. In real life, it's nothing, right? Exactly. Right. It's like a it's like a star in the galaxy compared to what Deshaun Watson did. So at the end of the day, like you said, it's all about the integrity of the game, and unfortunately, it's all about money. And money makes the world go round. Money makes everything go round. You're yeah. absolutely but right. It's it, just like how it, why Reed is not allowed around a 500 feet of a playground. You know, exactly same thing. right. But say what you want. <laughs> at least, at least, I, at least I slow down in school zones. Um, but. Uh, <clears throat> But also, like when it comes to <laughs> when it comes so to like the off the field stuff, the only stuff I got, the only thing I got to say to Deshaun Watson is Deshaun, quit stealing my moves. All right, <laughs> not a good book. You're stupid. Quit. I don't do now. This quit. next question is from Digital Guru in the Discord chat. Reed, do you think that Deron Payne will have a great training camp? He's heard John Kime say he has looked great so far. Perhaps we should sign him during the season. Digital Guru says. Yeah. No, I do. I think. I think Deron Payne's going to have a big year. I, I think that he's going to put us in a spot where if he doesn't outplay uh, what what the, the contract, like as long as he can remain reasonable, I think that we would love to keep him. I, I really do. I think that hearing Kedrick Golson talk about him and how good he actually is and that a lot of people don't really realize it because he's on the defensive line and what he's asked to do, but like as good as he actually is, you want, you've got to keep, you want to keep somebody like that. Um, it, it's a punch in the face if, if you don't, if you can't keep him. Um, but 
Yeah, I, I hope so. I hope we do get him resigned because I, I love Duran. Uh, you know, like I said, I, I've said before, I'm a masochist, baby. I love pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I do. It, honestly, Duran Payne should be having a good camp. Same with Jonathan Allen. Obviously, Jonathan Allen's going against Andrew Norwell. But Chase Ruye is not back in the lineup yet. And obviously, Wes Schweitzer is there. And Wes Schweitzer is no slouch. But we have heard that they've been rotating offensive linemen in. And guys that obviously are there for depth. Though Deron Payne being one of the highest rated defensive tackles by Madden in the NFL today should be having a field day. That being said, I really hope that the commanders are able to work a long-term deal with Deron Payne. I would love to see Jonathan Allen take a kind of uh, brotherly kind of, not I'm not going to say pick up, but just adjust his contract to be able to make it work with Deron Payne so it's not heavy on the team long-term. I would love to see something like that to prove the camaraderie and to build the foundation for the future here. Uh, absolutely would love that, but that being said, I'm not going to cry if Deron Payne leaves. You know, he is a quality talent. He's a young man. He's still, what, 24, 25 years old. His future is very, very bright. But we knew this day would come, that these first-round picks would have to be paid at some point, and we knew it was going to be hefty. That time is going to come, and we just have to be okay with it, I guess. Real fast, as soon as Deron Payne tweeted that Archie 3 was a turf eater, I made up my mind that I wanted him to stay because that was the <laughs> coolest insult I've ever heard. Uh, that was pretty funny. That was definitely an insult that they, like, talk together, you know, like players. <laughs> like these. Oh, I think he was frying Archie. I think Archie 3 got offended about it, and I'm pumped about it. Um, yeah, I definitely think he's ha he's probably having a good training camp. I think once they put the pads on, you'll definitely hear more about Deron Payne having a good training camp and – like uh, Kendrick Grosson said, he's a very, very powerful guy, great pad level. So could definitely see him uh, standing out and being standing out during the season. I think he's going to have a really, really good season because nine out of 10 players in a contract year have good seasons because money motivates a lot of people, especially millions of dollars. Thirsty dogs run faster, baby. There you go. Yeah. But um, as far as him re-signing here, uh, at this point, I'd probably give it like a 20% chance just because, like you said, there's so many people on the D-line and so many people's contracts coming up that you just pretty much got to pick and choose, like, who can we pay, who can't we pay? What is the market going to be? Where is the market for the D-tackles going to be at next year? Having and I also think it has to do defensive with – tackles is a luxury as opposed to, you know. Exactly. And I just think it has to do with Mathis. I think if Mathis steps in there and has, like, a really good year, shows a lot of growth and, like, really a lot of promise, I think it'll be a little bit easier for them to move on from Deron Payne because you have a younger guy coming in to kind of replace him and step up and uh, take his place. I agree. Now, this last question is from our guy, Brant, on Twitter, Commander BT. I was like, we got a question from Andrew Brant? Oh, we're making no. Moves. So I had a thought on one of our biggest changes in the offseason. Has, has anyone had any observations on the new tight end coach, Juan Castillo, Reed? Um, no, like I said, uh, since I haven't been down there at all, <coughs> um, no, but it, I mean, hey, it, Either we're hitting on tight ends and we just have done a good job at finding this talent, uh, like which you can make that argument. I mean, we've done that the last few years. But, uh, I mean, it seems to be doing all right, man. Every, everybody seems to be progressing well. I haven't heard any bad things about any of these guys yet. So, uh, and I mean, we have high hopes for the young guys. So, I, I, I like him. I, I think that he's a well-respected coach, and I can't wait to see what he does. Yeah, when we were at OTAs, so there was one obvious observation for me. But that Juan Castillo is one flexible dude. He's sitting over there stretching. You know, How flexible. Kind of an older guy. You know, like, obviously, he's very limber. He's walking around in sweatpants in the middle of summer. I love that about a coach. Um, I listened to Ron Rivera on YouTube, his mic'd up session at practice today. And there was one point in that in that video, you could see Juan Castillo taking a tight end over. I think it was Curtis Hodges taking him over and teaching him up a little bit. And so it just, I at first was concerned about Juan Castillo because Pete Hainer was obviously very respected and the results spoke for themselves, what he did with those tight ends. So I was, I was worried about using a guy like Juan Castillo who's never been a tight ends coach before coming in and, and teaching. But like we've heard from Logan Paul, so the tight ends get taught blocking the same way offensive linemen do. So it makes sense for Juan Castillo to be the tight ends coach and I think that he has done a great job so far I think the the being elevated of Cole Turner automatically being you know said as a guy that's going to be make this roster I think says a lot about Juan Castillo that things are getting off on the right start and I, I, I do like to hire a lot yeah I mean coming uh, coming behind a guy like Pete Hainer who just gets so much production out of great tight ends like Greg Olson throughout his time and obviously you see what he's done with uh, Logan Thomas pretty much just transforming his whole career here in Washington from a starting or from a second string, third string type of guy to a starter. 
and then guy who brags about like the a, kind of car that he drives. Yeah, and then like a top ten guy that drives his rear core, and uh, yeah, I definitely think. Uh, but it, I think it'll be like kind of with with Logan Thomas, where you got to wait till the season starts to kind of see like on the field when they're going against other guys how the results are because in practice, like the new one blocking drills, like it's kind of designed to benefit the guy that you're trying to get the blocking skills like up for. So I definitely think that uh, once the season starts, if you see a guy like Cole Turner that has uh, improved on his blocking, if you see a guy like John Bates, like start to make more plays, obviously he's already a great blocker, but if he gets involved more in the passing game and starts like kind of shining, then I think that'll reflect great on Juan Castillo. And then you'll be able to judge the type of job he's doing so far. Yep. Hopefully that happens soon. And look guys, this is Monday. They got a great week of training camp lined up for everybody. We will be recording again on Friday night. Looks like on Friday morning I'll be trending, uh, attending training camp uh, this season, so it's going to be a lot of fun. I haven't been since you OTAs. So I'm really looking forward to it. Hopefully uh, Mike Hall and Reed are able to make it out with us. Well, you're still trying to get approved for it, right, Hall? Yeah, I didn't even mention it today. I'm going to say something to Henry like tomorrow because – Everybody's running around with their heads cut off today, pretty much. Yeah, I definitely know what that's like. That was yeah, insane. Yeah. too, because Kyle's a serial killer. <laughs> it's not true. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. We'll see you guys again on Friday. And reminder, we have our third annual Fantasy Football League, the Burgundy Zone League, coming up here soon. So if you want to get involved, we, we have one league with 12 teams. And uh, we're, we're going to reach out to some people, see if they want to redo it, if they want to do it again or not. But uh, we are always open to open up a second league. If these guys don't want to be the commissioner of it, I'll do it. I don't care. And so uh, you guys can all come and get your shot at the champ. You know, two-time champ, by the way. I won two, two years ago. Yeah, I won the other two. You don't remember that? You no, not last season, the season before. Yeah, I know. I won the first season in uh, last season. All right, everybody. That's going to wrap us up oh for this my episode. God. We will see you guys on Friday. You're now realizing. I yeah. did. I realized. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. We'll see you then. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, we always we love to hear from you guys. If you have a question you want to submit to the show, find us on Twitter or, re- or just ask the question on YouTube. We'd love to hear from you guys. All right. I'm Kyle. I am going to take Reed's advice and never strive for greatness and just, you know, just always set the bar low so I can always achieve way higher than I can. Cause I'm there old. you go. That's the way to do it. And I am feeling former- himself today. <laughs> I, I am a former NFL scout under under Bill Parcells and Bill Belichick. Yo, I'm I have whatever that it takes. Person fried his that life with that comeback. So funny man. Made me oh, made me chuckle. Made me chuckle real hard. Very good. Yeah. All right, everybody. We'll see you on Friday. Washington football. Woo! Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Kyle. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. And if you liked what you saw, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you get notified when anything new is uploaded to the channel. Also, we just launched theburgundyzone.com. You can go there and find all of our latest news, articles, and the latest episodes that are uploaded. Again, we also have the Discord chat server where all of our VIP folks are in, like Andy Burroughs, Scott Hartley, Sergio Martin is in there as well. Don't miss out on the Discord chat server. Go and check that out. Until next time, everybody, Washington football. Hey!